In this lecture, we will introduce the idea of using a sensor to measure things in the physical world. There are several different kinds of sensors that are used, and microcontrollers are oftentimes used to measure information using those sensors. So what are sensors? Well, sensors rely on several different properties to detect changes in the physical environment. Those could be chemical properties, so as one uh, chemical reacts with another chemical, one metal reacts with one liquid or things like that. You can detect those changes. You might have a mechanical change, so something may be spinning and giving rise to torque or things like that. You may have a deflection of a beam or a uh, stretching of a material. You may also have electrical properties, so you might see changes in resistance or changes in conductance, uh, changes in capacitance. And you will see several of these in your sensors measurements and controls class if you have not already taken that course. These changes in the environment could be internal to the system. So for example, you may be trying to change the pressure inside of a tank. You may be trying to change the temperature inside of a particular water bath. You may be trying to change the air temperature inside of a house. They may also be external to it. So outside of your house, you may have the temperature of the ambient air, you may have wind, you may have uh, precipitation, all sorts of things happening outside of the system, which may in turn influence how your system internally needs to operate. Sensors can be active or passive in response to the environment. An active sensor generally has to seek out the uh, information that it's trying to measure by sending a signal or doing something to place itself in position to collect such data. It also may be passive, so it may just be a device that's in line with the circuit and then as changes are detected, it automatically changes because of its own internal properties. We'll see some examples of both active and passive sensors as we go through this lecture. So here are just some ideas of some things that you might want to sense. So temperature sensing is very common. You might also be interested in position or speed if you're talking about a vehicle, you're talking about a forklift, you're talking about an aircraft, all sorts of things. You want to know how fast they're going or where they're located. Acceleration as well, so you make sure that you can account for any jerk that might exist. Uh, revolutions per minute, so if you're thinking about how active your engine is or how much a specific gear is turning, you might need to check that in a transmission so you know when to shift, those types of things. You might also be measuring the pH to determine how acidic something is or how basic it is. You may be, if you're designing a weather station, want to know how fast the wind is coming or to detect a hurricane or a tropical storm. You may be looking at water flow and trying to measure the flow through a pipe. Perhaps you're working for a utility company and you want to know how much water is being used or you're working for uh, a system that, or working to develop a system that's designed to measure water flow out of fire hydrants to make sure they're capable of pumping enough water to fight a fire, smoke detectors, you want to detect the presence of smoke. You may be looking at voltage, current, and resistance like you measure with a multimeter. You may be looking at pressure. So that could be on something as simple as a vegetable scale or a bathroom scale. You may be looking at uh, pressure sensing on a device like a smartphone. Now they can detect different pressure on a smartphone so they know you're not only touching it, but they know how hard you're touching it and that can be processed differently. You may be wanting to detect light versus dark, so that way you can have automatic lighting or you may want to do some other response when it becomes dark or light. Um, you may want to detect different colors, so perhaps you're sorting uh, different glass by colors or you're sorting different products and one color goes in one bin, one color goes in another. You may want to check the proximity, how close am I to something else, thinking about uh, bumpers in the the back and front of cars if you're trying to develop a smart parking system. Detecting lines, you've seen that for line following systems, that's also very important in manufacturing if you have something that is trying to follow a specific line or pathway. And also there may be a lot of biological info, maybe you want to detect blood type or maybe you want to detect um, skin temperature, maybe you want to detect body position or the presence of some type of bacteria. You have different types of sensors and systems that are designed to check for such conditions. Some sensors are analog and some sensors are digital. Um, analog sensors typically measure things that are naturally analog in the real world. Things like temperature um, is not just binary. It is not hot or cold. It is different levels of hot, different levels of cold. 
and things like wind. You have various ranges of wind. It's an analog quantity. So most of the sensors that we use are analog by nature. Some are digital and it's becoming more and more common to see digital sensors, things that automatically convert from the analog quantity into the digital world. And so these sensors may be automatically converting to digital or you may need to interface with an analog to digital converter in order to convert those analog signals into a digital representation so you can process it with a microcontroller, microprocessor based computer. In order to do that, in order to do that digitization of the signals coming off of the sensor, you need to understand the properties of the sensor. One of the key things you need to know is what is the expected voltage range? So when am I going to have a high voltage? When am I going to have a low voltage? How broad of a signal range can I see out of the sensor? That's going to determine what kind of an analog to digital converter I can use. So if you're using the default settings on board your PIC microcontroller, you need a voltage range that goes between 0 and 5 volts. And if you don't have that range, you might need to put in an amplifier to scale down that voltage or you might need to expand it out to use the entirety of that range. You may need to know what are the typical values. So if I have, let's say, an accelerometer and it's just at rest, what is the typical output from that accelerometer going to be? You may need to know how to configure that particular sensor. So you may need to set up some different signals going on to different inputs and say this is the mode that I'm using this sensor in because there may be different options on that sensor. Let's talk about some different things and how we can measure those. So proximity is one of the things that we might be very interested in. So this is very important if you're developing a system to detect how close a vehicle is to colliding with something behind it. Let's say you're backing out of a parking space. You want to make sure you're not going to back into the car behind you or something like that. Robots want to know how far am I from something else. So if I have a robotic gripper that's trying to pick up something or put a bolt or pick up uh, different devices along an assembly line, tools, things like that, I want to detect how close am I to that tool, how close am I to that part. Very important in manufacturing applications. It's also important in automated plumbing. More and more places have these automatic flush toilets and you want to know how close are people to it and that way you can determine if someone is using the facilities or simply walking by to know when you need to flush. So switches can act as sensors. In this case we have a switch based on using what are called whiskers. These come with the Bobot. You may or may not have used them in some prior courses but uh, with these you have a long thin metal piece that's shaped like a whisker on an insect or a cat and it goes out and if it is bumped, let's say it runs into something out here, this metal gets bent back and when this metal gets bent back, this whisker part comes in contact with these metallic pins. And as you know on the breadboard, this whole column is connected electrically. So when you make contact here, that also makes contact with this resistor and so you can end up changing the properties of this voltage divider so you can see a different signal come in. And so here you see the, uh, the basic circuit that we have here. And so you have VDD. If the whisker is open, if it's not in contact, let's say the right whisker right here, then this acts as an open circuit. And so under those conditions, you see VDD. This is a high impedance port here coming in. And so you see a positive voltage right here. And so if this is closed, then what you see is a short um, to ground and so you see a lower voltage going in to P7 likewise on P5 if you have your left whisker attached or not. Ultrasonic sensors are active sensors so unlike the whisker which is a passive sensor it just bumps into things or it does not the ultrasonic sensor is actively seeking what the distance is between it and the nearest obstacle and so it does what's called a chirp that is, it sends out a small pulse. It's called ultrasonic because it's a sound pulse. These are effectively speakers and microphones. So you're sending out a sound pulse, which may or may not be within the uh, frequencies that humans can hear. You may be able to hear these, you may not. And then as those sound waves bounce off the nearest obstacle, they come back and you listen for that echo. And the duration of time that passes from the time you send out that signal until it comes back can tell you the distance that that obstacle is away because we know 
that sound travels a fixed speed through air. So if you know the medium, most likely it's going to be air, then you can ch determine the time difference between the signal going out and the signal coming back, and in turn, based on the velocity of sound in air, you can figure out how far away you are. Here is another kind of a proximity sensor. This is a photo detector and emitter, uh, or photo emitter detector pair. And there's several different orientations for that. This is very commonly what you see on automated flush toilets. Here's one example. And it sends out a light pulse. And normally, this light is just going out and perhaps bouncing off of another wall or bouncing off the door of a stall. But then when a user comes up and they are in the way, then it bounces off of your shirt and that changes the reflectance of that light coming back. And so it detects the presence of an individual. These can be oriented in several different ways. You can have them in opposed mode, in which case you've got a receiver opposite of the emitter. And then if a, an obstacle comes through and breaks that beam of light, then it knows that an object's detected. This is useful in things like a security system, or if you had something that you were trying to count how many people were walking through a door or something like that, you wanted to count how many patrons you had visiting a museum or a theme park or something, you could do that with an emitter detector uh, oriented this way. If your emitter and your detector are in the same housing, what you might want to do is just have a target over here. So if you don't want to just bounce off of the wall, you could bounce off of a reflector and that allows you to have a little bit broader range. So this is a reflector just like you might see on a bicycle, perhaps a little bit more industrial grade. This is in diffuse mode. So in this case, you normally have some of that signal diffused bouncing off of a passive flat object and then some of the light comes back. So in this case, you get most of the light coming back off of that uh, targeted reflector. In this case, most of the light will diffuse, but you're going to get some of it coming back in this particular alignment. Temperature is very important to measure. There are several different ways for you to do that. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to do that. So a lot of manufacturing processes, particularly if you're thinking about bioprocess applications, you want a particular reaction chamber to operate at a specific temperature. If you're getting into baking, you want your oven to operate at a specific temperature. Batteries also don't operate terribly well at extreme temperatures. If it's very cold, the battery tends to not work as well. And also batteries, if you overheat them, they can leak and they can have poor performance there as well. Some systems can actually be harmed if they are overheating. So a lot of times you have a temperature gauge, your vehicle checks to make sure that you are not getting over temperature. Also your laptops have generally fail safes built into the motherboard to make sure that that system is not overheating. And usually that can be rectified just by opening up a vent or perhaps in the case of your engine, you may just not have enough coolant in the engine, those types of things. Um, but it's very important to check that so you don't damage your engine, so you don't damage your electronic components. It also is important to regulate heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. So if something's too cold, you want to turn on the heater. If something's too hot, you want to turn on the air conditioning, um, or maybe just open up a vent to let in fresh air. Temperature measurement is done a lot of different ways. You may have been exposed to some of these. Um, most all of us have probably had the chance to have our temperature measured in a doctor's office or maybe you're feeling ill so you just measured it at home and you had a liquid in glass. Those liquids used to be mercury back in the day but we've since found out that mercury is not terribly good for us so a lot of those have switched over to certain types of alcohol that have expansion at different temperatures and so you see that metallic uh, color rise up inside of the glass to show us what our temperature is in that thermometer. Bimetallic strips are also one application of sensor measurement and so really here what's happening is you're relying on two dissimilar metals uh, being fused together and as you know in hot and cold environments metals tend to deform and so if you get things too hot the metal tends to, tends to uh, expand and if you get things cold the metal tends to constrict and so if you have two different metals, their constriction or expansion tends to be different on the two different strips. And so the change in deflection can help us to figure out what the temperature is. This is the way that a lot of thermostats used to operate. So if you have an older thermostat in your home, chances are if you open it up, you'll see a metallic strip wound around 
in a, uh, a circle there, and that is just based on using these two different kinds of metals to determine the change in temperature. Thermistors you are probably very familiar with from your circuit analysis class, maybe a little too familiar, but uh, just to refresh your memory on how temperatures or, or how uh, temperature sensing is done with a thermistor, these are effectively variable resistors and the variability comes from changing temperatures. They come in two different varieties. There are negative temperature coefficients and positive temperature coefficients. And what that means is it determines how those resistance properties change with respect to temperature. So if you have a negative temperature coefficient, as your temperature goes up, your, resisti your resistance goes down. If you have a positive temperature coefficient, then as your temperature goes up, your resistance also goes up. The way these work is that you have a nominal resistance that occurs at a nominal temperature. So R0 is your nominal resistance and at, that occurs at some nominal temperature. Typically R0 may be somewhere on the order of about 10,000 ohms or 10K, but they can be higher or lower depending upon which thermistor you buy. Typically the nominal temperature is around 25 degrees Celsius and so that's a good uh, normal temperature and from there if it's hotter or colder you're going to see the resistance of that thermistor be different from the nominal. And the formula that determines that is here and so this R0 is your nominal temperature, E is just the natural number E raised to this power and so here T is your temperature generally in Kelvin and T0 is that nominal temperature also in Kelvin and then you have this beta which is your temperature coefficient so depending upon whether you are positive or negative temperature coefficient that will either be positive or negative. A thermocouple is another way you might see temperature measured and that also relies upon two dissimilar metals and they can produce a very small voltage but in the junction of those two metals at different temperatures. This is known as the Seebeck effect, but this voltage change is very, very small, usually on the order of millivolts. So generally, in order to get any kind of significant voltage change, instead of just using one single thermocouple, we typically arrange them in what are called thermopiles. And so if you just create these thermocouples and add them in series, then the voltages add together, just like stacking batteries on top of one another. Thermocouples are made out of a lot of different kinds of metals. Here you see some examples. There's several alloys. Nickel is commonly used in a lot of these um, just to have differences in the metal material there. Acceleration is also very commonly measured. A lot of you are probably carrying accelerometers with you everywhere you go. You may not think about that, but you are. Um, this is a sensor that's used to measure the rate of change or speed of motion. So most of us in our smartphones have accelerometers. That is what allows us on our smartphones or our tablets to reorient pictures and web pages and things to either portrait or landscape mode depending upon how we have rotated the image. They're also useful in video games, things like the Nintendo Wii. So as you're moving your controller around, they determine that you meant to throw a strike or you meant to uh, bowl or you meant to do different things um, while moving your arm around, that's all based on accelerometers being sent, the data from an accelerometer being sent wirelessly back to the video game console. Laptops also oftentimes have accelerometers in them. Back about 10 or 12 years ago, Apple was one of the first companies that started putting accelerometers in their laptop. And they were in there to detect if someone was dropping their laptop, and if they detected a false scenario, what they would do is park the read head for the hard drive. So otherwise, if you dropped your laptop while it was actively seeking the hard drive, it may have put the read head and shoved that right on through the platters and damaged your disk. But this way, you may still damage your laptop, but chances are you have uh, a better chance of recovering the data from your hard drive by not jamming the read head through. Now, in the case of solid state disks, that may not be as necessary as it was before, but it's still probably a good idea on a lot of systems to brace for impact if they do detect a false scenario. So the way these work, you can think about them like a spring mass damper system. And so the way that works is you have inside of an accelerometer, there is a piezoelectric crystal, 
and there is a mass and a spring, and that mass may either elongate or stretch out that crystal, or it may be compressing that particular crystal, depending upon which way the motion is going. And so when you move an accelerometer, the compression changes. And in turn, the electrical properties of that crystal also change because the signal that is coming out of the piezoelectric is in response to the level of compression that is seen inside the accelerometer. And so you can measure that electrical change and determine, based upon how much that signal has changed, what the current acceleration is and also what the current orientation of that accelerometer is. So here you see, this is the piezo crystal inside of there. There's a mass that sits on top of there. Here's your spring, and that helps just to keep things damped so it doesn't bounce around too much. And so as you accelerate up, then this mass is going to compress down on the piezo crystal. As you, as you accelerate downward, then that mass may be pulled by the spring and not compress the piezo crystal as much. So here's a typical accelerometer. They can be larger, um, they can also be quite small. Navigation is also very important, so we're relying on GPS signals more and more, and that is done using satellites. And so there are multiple satellites up in the sky that, deter that help us to determine our position on the ground, and they use a process called triangulation. And triangulation works by figuring out how long it takes for a signal from one satellite to reach your GPS receiver, figuring out how long it takes for the signal from another satellite to reach you, and at least another one. Usually you want about nine or ten different satellites in communication, but with a minimum of three, you can figure out where you are. And this illustrates the process. So if I have three such satellites, and let's say I'm here on the globe, then I have three such satellites pointing down at me, Based on one satellite, I know I'm somewhere on the surface of this sphere. So I know how long it took. Usually these GPS signals have a timestamp in there so they know what time they were emitted and then you know what time you have received them. And so based on that difference in time, you can determine you're somewhere on this sphere. Then if you have another signal, you know you're somewhere on this sphere. And the intersection of two spheres is a circle and so you know you're somewhere on that circle. Then if you have a third sphere, you know the intersection of three spheres is exactly one point. So you can determine where you are on that one, uh, based on where you are on those three spheres. So you can determine that one point where you are located. You can also do navigation with your smartphone. Oftentimes it relies on GPS. But if you don't have your GPS module turned on, a lot of smartphones nowadays will also navigate using Wi-Fi signals. They do that because when you have Wi-Fi that is connected to a particular network and your network assigns you an IP address. And so in your home you have an IP address and that IP address is associated with a physical address. So if I go down the street and I know that I'm detecting your Wi-Fi signal, because your IP address tells me something about who you are and where you happen to be located, then I can know I'm in close proximity to your house or I'm in close proximity to whatever business happens to be within Wi-Fi range of where I am. You can also use cell tower location. So if you have a connection to a particular cell phone tower, you know where that is. And then if you have a signal from another cell phone tower and yet a third one, you can also do triangulation between those. If you simply have a connection to one cell phone tower, you know you happen to be within uh, the range of the signal radius that is going out, but you could be in any circle around that cell phone tower. So the more signal you can get from different cell phone towers, the better you are at positioning yourself even without GPS location. You may have noticed if you turn on navigation on your phone, it may prompt you for uh, the opportunity to make an even more accurate assessment of your position using Wi-Fi and things like that, and that is exactly what it's doing. Is It's using the nearby Wi-Fi signals to try to hone in on exactly where you are in physical space. Stress and strain is also very important, so you want to know when something is deflecting, you want to know when a beam is buckling, you want to know if a material is being expanded a little bit too much or what's happening in terms of deflection of force. This is also what happens inside of your scale. Um, so you want to know 
how much uh, weight you have put on a particular scale and that's typically measured by putting a strain gauge inside of the scale. And when it is deformed, you're effectively changing resistance. So typically here you have this foil grid and as you stretch it out, you actually end up slightly elongating these foil strands and that is changing the resistance measured from here to there. And so that is changing the properties of that circuit and in turn a uh, voltage level will change and so you can determine how much stress or strain you have if you know the properties of the metal that is used in that strain gauge. Strain gauges and ultrasonic sensors were used in one application uh, several years ago. This is a little over 25 years ago now. Um, the Nintendo Power Glove came out and this was a novelty controller for the original Nintendo Entertainment System and the way this operated was you had on the back of the hand two speakers and they emitted small clicking sounds and then you would put this together in an L shape this would be connected and they would lean on your television and these would be three microphones and depending upon how intense the sound was and how long it took from the time it was emitted here until it was received there on the different microphones you could determine where the hand was in front of the television how much you were moving your particular hand and there were different programs that would um, allow you to do different things. So the most famous application was a game called Punch-Out or Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, which is a boxing game. And so as your hand moved different directions, it would detect different punches. They also had this for driving games and flying games and all those different things. And you could move your hand different places along the screen. You could also control things by gripping your thumb and your other fingers and there were strain gauges inside of each of these fingers and as you deflected your fingers and gripped or released they determined whether you were pulling your index finger or your thumb and you could actually control different buttons using the uh, different using the strain gauges in your finger or your thumb just by gripping those the strain gauge would detect what your hand was doing this also was used in virtual reality environments so prior to this um, gloves like this did certainly exist and they were used in virtual reality environments. You can think about things with head mounted displays or cave environments where you have a projected virtual world. But virtual reality gloves were incredibly expensive on the order of thousands of dollars. And a lot of hackers actually took these power gloves and they hacked into them because they were very low cost relative to um, the cost of a virtual reality glove. These were usually on the order of about $100, much cheaper than what you might have um, for a virtual reality glove at the time. So how do you read sensor data? Oftentimes you need to do analog to digital conversion. Um, in some cases the sensor signal is coming in digitally in which case you're going to have to know how to process serial data. We'll talk a little bit later on in the course about how to do serial communication. In that case you're going to read one single bit at a time and process that bit, perhaps uh, rotate through and compile several bits together. And you also need to know something about what the signal is you expect, so you know how often to sample. So depending upon what you're measuring, you might need to sample very often, and in other cases you might need to only sample once or twice a day. It just depends upon what you're trying to read in as to how often that signal might change and how often that change is really relevant to your application. And so you need to know the range of that signal, what kind of voltage can I expect, and also, you may be able to detect more than just the signal you're interested in. So you may need to use a filter to get rid of signals that you're not interested in. And you may also have a signal that comes in and is very small. So you may need an amplifier to actually uh, amplify or boost that signal so you can get it into a readable range. So the next several weeks will involve uh, some labs using different types of sensors. I just wanted to whet your appetite for what is yet to come in the course.